Red Brick Media. High quality CDs, DVDs, lectures, khutbah, conferences and Quran recitations. All revenue generated supports our dawah work. Supported by visiting our store. You can now purchase directly from our site www.redbrickmedia.co.uk أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد All praises due to Allah we praise him we seek his aid and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evil consequences of our actions whomsoever Allah guides none can lead astray and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray none can guide I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped, none has the right to our ultimate love and devotion, but Allah alone, without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. The best of speech is that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the best guidance is that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And the worst thing in the religion are the newly invented matters, and all the newly invented matters are innovation and every innovation in the matters of the deen is misguidance and every misguidance takes its people to the hellfire. On the way I was thinking of the topic for this talk, hopefully trying to make the topic beneficial and practical. Because many a times we might learn something but not be able to act on it or walk away without any practical knowledge and it's just some kind of information we stored it in our heads and that's not the point of knowledge the purpose behind knowledge is what we can act upon and that's exactly what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud used to say Al-ilm at-taqwa knowledge is taqwa taqwa is something that is usually apparent or it has clear manifestations it's it reflects on our actions and our attitudes. The point Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was making here is that real knowledge, al-ilm al-nafi', beneficial knowledge, is that which reflects on who you are. That's why learning, according to the early scholars of Islam, is not storing information as the majority of the students of knowledge do today. Because knowledge without being digested without being processed and personalized could bring about a negative effect. And that's the secret behind the companions learning five verses, verses at each time, learning the knowledge in, in, therein and acting on that knowledge. And then after they have completed this, they move on to another five verses. That's the way they used to study Islam. And that's why they learned and that's, that's why they excelled. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was pointing to this fact that real knowledge is what reflects on your actions. And this is why in the field of education today, they say learning is being. Learning is being. That means if the knowledge that you learn or the knowledge you acquire, does, if you don't process it, if you don't break it down and personalize it and it becomes part of who you are, if it doesn't mix with your blood, and your flesh, you haven't learned anything. You've just stored information. You're just like any other book on the shelf or any computer that stores so many books and data. But that's not what knowledge is all about. Knowledge is about acting. And that's the definition that the scholars give to Al-Huda. Al-Huda wa deen al-Haqq. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he sent his Prophet وسلم, with Al-Huda and deen al-Haqq. Huda, the guidance, the scholars say that's beneficial knowledge that has the potential to change your behavior, to change who you are, to change your ways in acting. What deen al-haqq is the actual acting on knowledge. So if you learn something and you don't, ultimately you don't act upon it, it doesn't change you, 
it doesn't make you a different person in a sense then in brief you have wasted your time because you will be questioned about that time and you will be questioned about that knowledge what did, what did you do with it that's why the Prophet ﷺ used to seek refuge in Allah every day every morning he would say Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa' Oh Allah I seek your protection and I seek refuge in you from knowledge that is not beneficial that means knowledge that will not reflect on me knowledge that will not make me better so hopefully, inshallah, this night, in these few uh, moments, we'll try to share something that is hopefully beneficial. Now I would like to start with a question. That means I haven't started yet. I'll start with a question. Why did you come here to the masjid? This special visit that you paid to this masjid, to the house of Allah, why did you come to the masjid? To learn new things. Okay, that's one answer. Who has another reason? Why did you come to the masjid? Okay, who has an answer but doesn't want to share it with us? Keep it to yourself, I don't mind. But who doesn't have a reason to come to the masjid? Who came to the masjid without a reason? <coughs> without a purpose? Anyone just happened to find... They found themselves walking through the door into the masjid? Is anyone... You know... Did anyone come to the masjid that way? Just found themselves walking through the, the door into the masjid? No one. So everyone has a reason? Okay. I'll leave it okay, at that point and I'll come back to it, inshallah, later. Uh, there's a beautiful hadith that we all know very well. That is reported by... Uh, in Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, most of the books start with this hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّةِ Indeed, actions or deeds are by intentions, by their intentions. وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى And every person will get that which they intended. That's a beautiful hadith. Imam al-Shafi'i says, one instance he says, this is half of the deen of al-Islam. These few words are half of the deen of al-Islam. Imagine if we learn half of Islam so practically and in a beneficial way, what could happen to us? So many things would change, change in our lives. In another instance in his book, Al-Um, Kitab Al-Um, Imam al-Shafi'i says, this hadith constitutes a third of Islam. A third of Islam. He was talking about a different angle. I'm concerned mainly with his first statement. This hadith represents half of Islam. That means if you understand it well and act upon it, you have half of Islam secured. You've guaranteed that. Now usually we get the basic interpretation when we say, okay, deeds are by their intention. Can anyone give me an explanation? I don't like doing all the talking, by the way. I like to share that. So, who would give me the famous explanation, brief explanation of this hadith? What do we mean deeds are by their intention? That's a general statement. Can anyone give me an answer? The acceptance of the Excellent. Excellent. The acceptance of the deeds is based on their intention. So, if you came to the masjid without any intention to pray, you just came to the masjid to meet a friend and you didn't want to pray in the festival but you found yourself embarrassed people are walking into the masjid and you're standing there so you said let me just pray do you expect reward from that if you just prayed with that intention purely with that intention obviously not that's the basic understanding of this hadith but we have a general problem that you find it mainly with and that's part of the plight of the Muslims today. That's one of the reasons why we are weak. Muslims are weak today. Because, because we aim at the bottom line. And we forget the main body of Islam. You know, we always aim at the basic level of Islam. Okay, just make sure we're Muslims. We're still within the circle of Islam. I do, you know, whatever is obligatory. Even if I do my sunnah, I do them without khushu' And I just do them to get by. But we forget about the higher levels, Iman. 
Ihsan. My personal estimation from 75% to 80% of the legislation in Islam is above the bottom line. And only probably 20% deals with the bottom line. And we have a bottom line culture, aiming at a bottom line. Do you pray? I, five the, I pray the five daily prayers, the obligatory. That's all what I do. Do you fast? I fast Ramadan. Do you treat your parents well? Well, I don't swear at them. I don't insult them. That's it. How do you treat your children? At a basic level. It's all aiming at the bottom line. But the companions of the, of the Prophet ﷺ did not have this, this kind of culture. They had a culture of aiming at the highest levels of Islam. And this is something the Prophet ﷺ taught them when he said, إِذَا سَأَلْتُمُ اللَّهِ if you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make a dua, فَاسْأَلُوهُ الْفِرْدَوْسَ الْأَعْلَى If you ask Allah for something, for paradise, ask Him for the highest level of paradise, الْفِرْدَوْسَ الْأَعْلَى That's what you should aim at. And that's why the Muslims really created a beautiful history that we still survive on. The honor that we still have today is the remnants of that great era. But we need to duplicate it. We need to follow that example of the companions of the Prophet Alhamdulillah, we are proud of trying our best to follow the example of the Prophet, of the Prophet and his companions, to follow their understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah. But that shouldn't be technical. We have to bring life to that concept. Really studying the life of the companions. How did they carry, how did they go about dealing with Islam? How did they relate to the Quran? How did they relate to the Sunnah of the Prophet what, is the, what was the level of at their aspirations? They would always aim at something far greater, far greater than the bottom line. So the bottom line with this hadith is the acceptance of the deeds is by their intention. So if your intention is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you do it in following the Prophet sallallahu then that's what you will get. But if you do it for another reason, to get a worldly benefit, as we said, you came to the masjid to meet a friend, that's what you're going to get. That's the basic meaning of the hadith. But that doesn't mean we stop here. That's the starting point. Now this hadith is so profound. Do you think that basic meaning, that's everything, that's half of Islam? No, that's the bottom line. To really find out why it is half of Islam, as Imam Shafi'i and others said, we need to explore the depth, the profound meanings of this hadith. Deeds are by their intention. I will give you an example, a scenario that, that is common. You have two young men coming to the masjid. Let's say that they are 20 years old each. They have the same level of intelligence. They have the same skills and they, are ex and they come or they read or they study with the same teacher. And they put the same amount of hours or number of hours to their studies. Ideally, everything is the same. One of them came to study because he feels this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows that when I learn to recite the Quran and I understand it, I will learn more about Allah because Allah tells us so much about himself in the Quran. I know when I learn the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I learn all these etiquettes, this beautiful way of life the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had. I'll learn all of this, and this is my way to paradise. So he finds his heart there. And that's the reason he came to learn. Or he came to the masjid to study. The other one saw a couple of students of knowledge. They're very good speakers. Or he saw some scholars. People respect them. People pay a lot of attention to them. When there's a problem, people go to them to sort out their problems. So that appealed to him. That social status appealed to him. He loved it. So he said, I want to be like one of those. I want that attention. I just love it. So he comes to the masjid to learn, to get that, to, to reach that level. Now my question, five years down the line, Five years from the time they started to study. Let's hypothetically say 
everything else is the same. Number of hours, intelligence, attention, etc. The knowledge they get exposed to is the same. The level of comprehension is the same. Okay. Do you think these people, five years later, do you think they will be at the same level of knowledge or they would know the same things? Supposedly, they were exposed to the same teachings or the same studies. Do you think they would be similar in terms of their knowledge? I'm asking a question. Who thinks they will be the same? No, who thinks? Well, m m most likely. Same? Who believes it's the same? Please put your hands up. There's no punishment, by the way. And no rewards. <laughs> okay. Who believes they'll be different? <coughs> up, up where I can see them. So the majority disagree with, <laughs> with you are. <laughs> they'll be different. They can never be the same. Impossible. It's not they might be impossible for them to be the same. And the reason is, the reason each one of them had to study Islam or to, to, to learn this knowledge. Someone paid attention to that. One of the great scholars of Islam, Ibn Hajar al Ibn Hajar al he said, إِذَا رَأَيْتَ الْحَدَثْ يَتَتَبَّعُ عُضَلَ الْمَسَائِلِ فَاكْتُبْ عَلَىٰ قَفَاهُ لَا يُفْلِحْ If you see the young man who just started seeking knowledge, if you find him searching for problematic issues, where there's a lot of dispute and debate, he's searching, gravitating to these matters, these arguments, then write on his back, with big handwriting, write, he will never be successful. La yuflih. Where did he bring that from? That's deep. The statements of our scholars are always deep. You can't take the surface meaning alone. It might give you some kind of insight, but you need to contemplate and dig deep. What does he mean by that? How, how did he predict that this guy will never be successful, even in seeking knowledge? From the style. The fact that this person is attracted to problematic issues, to disputes, that shows why he's studying. Because he wants to learn these controversial issues. He wants to learn these disputes. He has tendency to arguments. Because these kind of issues that have a lot of disputes, these are the ones that keep popping up in conversations and by learning them, you can always prove your point. You can always pretend that I know about this. But when issues that are quite clear, are brought up, most people don't think about them or don't bother stating their opinion because everyone seems to know about them or no one seems to bother about them. But usually controversial issues come to the surface and people start talking about them. And then each one will start to prove their point and show how much opinions about this they know and how many arguments they can exercise proving their point and substantiating their argument. So Ibn Hajar realized that since this person is attracted and he usually gra gravitates to these arguments and disputes, it shows, it gives a hint about his intention. Then his intention is what? To be argumentative, to, to gain the skill to win arguments. And that's why he's searching these things. That gives you an insight into what? The intention. The intention. Now I ask you the question, why did you come to the masjid? Why did you come to the masjid? Everyone has a reason why they came to the masjid. Unfortunately, when we talk about Islam, as I just mentioned in the, uh, at the beginning, we tend to be very technical. We like to use technical terms without realizing what they mean. This is why we find it difficult sometimes to relate them to our daily life. Why did you come to the masjid? Can anyone give me an answer? The basic answer. Hmm? No, precisely, why did you come to the masjid? 
to pray. Jazakallah. Came to the masjid to pray. What do we call this? That's the reason the brother came to the masjid. In, other, in technical terms, that's his intention. So intention is why. Why? Simple as that. We always think about the intention that before you stand to pray, you think about your intention. Um, I'm, going, I'm going to pray Isha for rak'ah behind the Imam. Obviously you don't say it, but you have this in, in your heart. Now, f funny, you know, some, sometimes people pr uh, state the, their, uh, their intention. And there was this guy in one city in Jordan. It's called Na'ur. Sheikh al Bani used to visit it often. And there's an old masjid there. This guy used to pray. He's an old man. And he would pronounce his intention. When the Imam said, Allahu Akbar, you could see that this man was getting troubled. Because he was trying to get his intention ready. The Imam goes for ruku'ah. <laughs> Why? He would say, I have the intention to pray for rak'ah dhuhr at the old masjid in the city of Na'ur behind the Imam so-and-so. And he would give a script <laughs> about all the circumstances as if it's a report. That was his intention, okay? That, that was, for him, that, that was making the intention. But we know that the intention is in the heart. But a lot of people, when, they, when the word intention is brought to them, they usually think, okay, I'm going to pray. What is my intention? I'll pray. I'm praying for rak'ah dhuhr. That's it. And jama'ah, etc. But that's a very technical term. The word intention is very human, very simple. If you want to know what intention means, ask the question, why? And intention doesn't have to do with salah, doesn't have to do only, only with salah, only with fasting, only with zakah. It has to do with everything we do in life. And take this as a rule. Without intention, there is no action. Without intention, there is no action. If you don't have an intention, you cannot do an action. Let's get, depart from the technical. Yeah, let's get a bit more human. Without intention, there's no action. Except for the involuntary actions. Your heart beat, your breath. Okay, put that on the side. And we use that with everyday language. When someone does something, you might ask him, Is that, was that intentional? Was that deliberate? What are you asking? You say, did you mean it? Did you have this intention? Without intention, there is no action. You know why this is now half of the deen? You know why the hadith is half of the deen? Without intention, there is no action. That's how humans function. I'll break it down a bit more. Well, I'll give you another aspect of intention. When, salah, when, when we talk about salah, we think about intention just before we start. Anyone disagrees? Anyone disagrees about this? Usually with salah, when we think about the intention, it's mainly the point before we start our salah. Anyone disagrees about this? Okay. But that's not the right way to do it. That's not the right way to do it. Intention is a continuous stream. There is no point in your life, there's no second, there's no millionth of a second in your life that goes about without you having a certain intention. Humans don't live without intention. To have intention is human. That's what, me, that's what it means to be alive. Except for a few cases. When you're sleeping, when you are unconscious. That's when you don't have intention. When you are awake, you have intention. So intention is a continuous stream. So when you start your salah, a lot of people have a problem with khushu'ah. A lot of people have, you know, complain about a problem of khushu'ah. They say, once I start my prayer, my mind goes all over the place. I think about everything except for the prayer. I think about family, business, school. I think about politics. I think about... Uh, people in the Amazons. But I hardly think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Why? It's an issue of intention. Because we think, because we, we fell in the trap of technicality, so we think about intention, it's only before I start my prayer. But intention is a continuous stream. Once you grow heedless of this fact, you will, your mind will go every, everywhere in the prayer. So if you want to maintain your khushur, all what you need to do is be aware of this fact that intention is a continuous stream. There's non-stop. There's no end. There's no moment of... You don't suspend your intention. You always have it. As long as you're alive and you are conscious, you have an intention. So that's why the intention of the prayer does not, is not limited to the beginning, but that's the most important part because that's the starting point. But throughout the prayer, you have to have intention. So when you recite Surah Al-Fatiha, you have to have an intention for why you're reciting it. And when you have this intention, you will start to have khushu'ah. When you go for ruku'ah, you shouldn't be doing that ideally. You shouldn't be doing that automatically. It's just your body moves out of its own memory. No. You sh it should be intentional. Most of us go through our prayer without intention. It's automatic. It's our body. It's the, the memory that is related to our bodies that goes down for ruku'ah. Sami Allah Muhammadah. Allahu Akbar goes down for sujood. Uh, you sit down, back for sujood, up again. And most of us go through the prayer and we can't even remember. We start questioning what rak'ah I am in. Because you've been, you've, been doing, you've been acting without intention. And it's Allah's mercy that He did not make the validity of the prayer conditional or dependent on this continuous uh, intention. Allah made it easy for us. He knows our weaknesses. So He, he just told you, make sure that before you pray, you have your intention. At least that's the starting point. It should help you maintain your khushu' till the end. And that's something we need to work towards. Now, where do I get this idea from? It's very common. Because you can't have khushu' with that, without this intention. And I'll explain more about intention. You will see how human it is, how common sense it is. But we, unfortunately, we don't think about it. This is why we need to think about so many things afresh. When we read the words of the scholars, sometimes we might think, okay, that's easy, I can understand it. But most of the time it's not. You need to dig deep and see, make connections and relate that to your daily life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah when he uh, talks about the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail when they built Al-Masjid Al-Haram. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ And as Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail were raising the foundations of Al-Masjid Al-Haram, of Al-Kaaba, they were saying, Oh Allah, رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا Oh Allah, accept from us. What does that tell you? As they were building, they were conscious of Allah. They were conscious why they were doing this. Remember, why is intention. They were aware, mindful, why I'm laying this brick. It's not automatic that I just do it out of habit, no. With every brick, and this is why they were mindful of Allah. As they were doing it, in the process of building it, they were saying, Oh Allah, accept from us. Oh Allah, accept from us. It shows you that intention was a continuous thing in their minds. So we need to keep our intention continuous. We need to focus. Now I, I have another question and I hope I can get a better, an, a better response. Sorry, I had some chili food with Sheikh Hassan Hanif before the talk and this is why maybe I have, <laughs> I'm expecting more energy from you as well. <laughs> I want you to think about intention. Intention. What shape would you give it? It's a strange question. What shape would you give intention? You might say it's intangible. What shape? You can't, you can't create a shape for it. That's th something for you to think about. I'll just summarize some of the points that I mentioned. Intention is something human. And there is no moment, there is no second in our lives without intention as long as we are conscious. As long as you are conscious, there is intention. 
Number two, intention is simply the answer to why, to the question that starts with why. So when you pray, when you make intention for the prayer, are you really answering why I am praying or what? Think about it. Are you really making intention? Are you answering the question what I'm doing here or why? I am doing this. Remember, intention is why. That's something that you need to think about. Most of us answer the question why. I'm praying for rak'ah. Dhuhr, asr, that's it. But intention is about why. Are you praying that for Allah subhanahu Are you mindful that I'm doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you doing this expecting something from Allah, something in return? That's what intention means. And you need to keep that till the end of the prayer. You have to maintain it until the last moment. And even, guess what? Even after the prayer. If you'd like to know more about this, all what you need to go to do is check Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali's commentary on the 40 hadith of al-Nawawi. His book is famous, Jami' al-Ulum al-Hikam. I'm not sure if it was translated into English. But even some of the, a lot of the explanations or commentaries on the 40 hadith in English, they have quoted Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali as he talks about intention. He talks about intention before, and he talks about intention during the action, and he talks about, about intention after the action. And it shows you that intention is a continuous thing. Intention is a continuous thing. Now, what does intention mean? What does it fall off from? Why is it a human thing? It's the difference between us, humans, and animals. Animals don't have intentions. Animals act on impulse. Animals act on impulse. Everything in the world acts on Allah's instructions to it. Impulse. They don't have choice about it. But humans have. Angels, they don't have intention, by the way. In the sense we have it. Angels can only do what Allah instructs them to do. They're just like the sun and the moon. They follow a set course and they can't break from it. They can't have intention. So intention is choice. Intention is choice. And that's the whole reason we are created. That's the whole reason behind our creation. We all know the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the story of creation. Allah said to the angels, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angels, I'm going to place on earth a khalifa. I'll keep the Arabic word, khalifa. قَالُوا أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءَ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ They said, Oh Allah, are you going to place on earth someone or somebody who will shed blood and bring mischief and corruption? Now, at that stage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had not yet created humans. So the angels don't know how the humans look like. They don't know what humans are all about. So how did they come up with an assumption or a prediction? How did they say, oh Allah, why do you place or why do you want to place on earth a creation that will bring about corruption and shed blood? How did they know? Let me see how many hands we have. <laughs> Give me, I need a sure answer. Don't shoot that permission. Okay, let me get the locals first. Excellent. That, that's one of the explanations in the tafsir. Okay? But there is no proof for that. There's no proof that the jinn used to live on earth. Okay? It's one of the statements of one of the, sorry, one of the scholars. They said there was, there was some kind of creation on earth and they did that and it pos most likely it was jinn and this is why the angels said, oh, it's the same story again. Okay? But there's a stronger opinion. Do you have another answer? No. Do you have another answer? 
No, no. Excellent. That's first step. Take it further. What does Khalifa mean? That's what I call the canned answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the word Khalifa, yeah, it means you have authority. You have power. You have basically decision. In other words, you have choice. You are given the choice of intention. You can choose what to do and why to do it. Now the angels know that Allah created the whole universe, including themselves, even including their intentions. So they don't have choice about the intentions. They just follow the instructions. And they know that this is how the world gets in order. Because it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah chooses for it. So it's definitely going to be the best or in the best shape. But Khalifa means Allah will give that creation the power or the, the capacity to, to have intentions and to choose. So the angel said, well, if someone else is going to make the intention, these people are going to have choice about their intention. What does that mean? It's not going to be the intention Allah chooses for them. So they're given the choice. That means things will fall out of order. Things will be in a state of chaos. Because only Allah's choice can be the best. That's it. So that's why they predicted. They said Khalifa, they understood from the word Khalifa. That means this creation will have the ability to choose choice. And they can have an inten the intention they want. You see? So that's why intention is something human. The angels don't have this. Animals don't have this. The sun doesn't have it. The moon doesn't have it. And that's the, the very concept that takes us either to paradise or the hellfire. Let me get some kind of feedback from you. Now, do you start, did you start to see why Imam Shafi'i said this hadith is half of the deen? Did it make more sense now? You see? These are all meanings within the same hadith. All of these are meanings within the same hadith. Now, a lot of people would like to do good things in life. A lot of people would like to lead a better life. The secret to all of this is intention. Intention is the secret of human behavior. Islam is not something, as I said, technical, that doesn't deal with basic realities and facts about life. Islam was sent down to make life, just as Imam Ibn al-Qayyim said, Allah sent down his sharia to make, his, to make life on this earth the best. In addition to the hereafter. And Imam Al-Qayyim says as well uh, concerning the verse in Surah Al-Infitar. إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ وَإِنَّ الْفُجَّارَ لَفِي جَحِيمٍ Indeed, the righteous ones are in tranquility and peace, happiness. And the evildoers are in a state of pain and agony. He said, anyone who thinks that the people of righteousness are in tranquility only in paradise and the evildoers are in, in pain only in the hellfire, then he's mistaken. The righteous ones are in tranquility in this world and in the grave and in the next life. And the people of evil are in pain and chastisement in this world, in the grave and in the hereafter. <coughs> So Allah sent down Islam for us to live it. To live it. That mean, what does it mean to live it? To live it in the masjid, to live it at home, to live it at work, in the streets, with your family, with your friends, with your neighbors, even with your enemies, in all, even in your sleep. And Islam is not only instructions when you sleep, you just put, put your right hand under your cheek and you say the adhkar. And that's the, that's the, the external side of it. But all of this has depth to it, has meanings. You're speaking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you sleep. And you are entrusting your soul with Allah. That means you're building that trust with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even when you go to sleep, you, should, you have an intention by the way. Do you know that when you go to sleep, you have an intention? People go to sleep to rest. There are people who go to sleep to get reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Mu'adh ibn Jabal. 
معاذ بن جبل used to say إني لا أحتسب نومتي كما أحتسب قومتي that I seek reward from Allah in my sleep just as I seek reward from Allah when I'm awake and I'm doing all these acts of worship how? with intention don't think I told you there's nothing you do without intention there is no split second in your life without intention everything you do has an intention behind it and that's a blessing and a problem at the same time do you know why? because intentions are part of this closed cycle cycle of life you know the cycle of water evaporates, goes up in the clouds and falls down as rain and evaporates and so on and so forth there's the same similar cycle that has to do with our hearts intentions actions and it goes back into our hearts feeds back into our hearts and this is why when you do an act of righteousness your iman increases because it feeds back into your heart your iman increases so you are you are on a level to do more righteous deeds now. So you do more and it becomes like an upward spiral. But if you have the wrong intention, what does that mean? You're mounting or you're on that downward spiral. So in reality, and I go back to another statement from Imam Shafi'i. Imam Shafi'i says there is no standstill in life. There's no point where you can actually stand or stay where you are. You're either making progress or you're either going backward. Because it's because of this reason that there is no moment in your life without an intention. So if you are not making a good intention, there's something else. There's another form of intention. It could be bad, it could be a lazy intention, careless intention. And guess what? According to that cycle, it feeds back into your heart. So you've got this indifferent attitude about what you do. You just do things out of habit. So there's, that, there's this indifferent intention inside you and it feeds back again into your heart and you grow indifferent. Sometimes you say, I don't know why I'm just like that. Maybe it's my upbringing. Maybe it's the environment. I can't change myself. You can. But you need to understand how. Allah gave us all the tools. And they are there in the instructions. But you know, we always take them at the surface level, at the bottom line level. At the bottom line level, issue, the issue of intention can change your life completely. Because there's nothing you do without intention. Nothing in your life you do without intention. And intention, I'll expand a bit more here on this point. Intention decides what you do and the level and quality of your performance. I'll give you a simple example. When you, do, when you do the things you like, when you do the things you like, don't you notice that your performance is at a higher level? When you spend time with the people you like, you're on a different level. Why is this? Because the things you like attract your intention. It's a matter of intention. When you like something, that means you have an intention towards it. So you have more intention. You have a focused intention. And that's why you find the time that you spend there interesting. Your performance is better. It's at a high level. But if you do something, when you don't like it, you're very unlikely to develop the intention. So it's either a weak intention or a negative intention. So your performance is low. Now another example that could bring the concept of intention down to our daily life. And you can take this as a rule. Intention or attention. Attention is a function of intention. Attention is a function or a result of intention. What does that mean? I'll, I'll, a daily, common scenario. 
Who recently bought a car? Who recently bought a car? No? Okay, what's the car? Sorry? Renault. Okay. Did you intend it to be Renault? You? <laughs> okay. So that's not a good example of intention. <laughs> now I want someone. Okay, that's the only brother who bought, recently bought a car. Okay, who bought a car last year? What, you don't have cars here? <laughs> or you keep them for 10 years? Last, last year you bought a car? Okay, what's the car? Galaxy. Galaxy? Okay. Did, were you interested in that type of cars? In that brand? A specific brand? Okay. How long did you search for it? Good, two, three months. I want you to go back to the moment you decided you wanted to buy a Galaxy car. Yeah? Go back in time to that moment and think carefully. Do you remember the day or the specific time you just had that intention? You decided, you made that choice, I wanted to buy or search for this kind of car? Okay. The moment you developed that intention, did you start seeing galaxy cars all over the place? <coughs> oh, they're not common anyway, are they? Okay. But did you start noticing them if they were around? More, more than before, yes? That's exactly the case. Now, if you got interested in some kind of an outfit, trainers, you wanted to buy them, any kind, even sometimes a book, you wanted to buy it, you got interested in a subject, and then you wanted to get it, get that uh, you know, outfit or that pair of trainers. All of a sudden you see everyone is wearing them. All of a sudden you see people walking down the street wearing a <laughs> pair of shoes. Why all of a sudden everyone is interested? No, they've been there <laughs> since ages. But it's your intention. That created what? Attention. You started, your mind became sharper at detecting things that you want, things you, things you have an intention for. You see why? You see how powerful intention is? Now let me go back to the, my example. It all feeds in by, together, by the way. The two students of knowledge who were studying. Do you think now do you think now, more than that they will arrive at different places, different levels of knowledge, different pieces of information? Yeah? Because of the different, different intention. They have a different intention, and that decided and determined what their minds became acute at discerning and detecting. Because your attention is a function of your intention. So attention or intention shapes your life. So in the prayer, if someone's intention is truly to pray for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they know for sure that this prayer, if I do it well, will bring me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before you go down to ruku', you know what meaning this ruku' has. You know how much it's loaded with meanings that relate to my heart and my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean when I put my head down in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What does it mean? Why am I doing it? When you have, that's intention by the way. This thought process is intention. So once you have it, you will start to pick more stuff in salah that you never thought were there before. There is so much beauty in salah that most of us have no clue about. You know why? Because there's no attention. Why? Because there's no, there's no the right, we don't have the right level of intention to generate that attention. So intention can change your life completely. Now all what I was talking about is intention about specific acts of worship. I'm talking about segments. I've, we have broken it down to segments. Salah, Fasting, uh, zakah, even sleeping, we said. 
You see, with intention, even sleep could be written on your records as good deeds. Sleep. You could be snoring and your hasanat, meters running, you know, faster than the petrol <laughs> meter. But there's a higher level of intention. There's a higher level of intention. What is this? It has to do with the general intention in your life. And the scholars of Islam, the early scholars of Islam, called, used to call this al-'atifa the dominant passion in your life. Each one of us has a dominant passion in their lives. And what is this dominant passion? Ideally, it's tawhid. What does it mean? Let's use the same principles. What is the question for intention? Why? So when you are trying to find out what is my dominant passion in life, that means what is my general intention in life? What is the intention of my life? You're asking why I'm here. Why? What's the point of me living? What's the point of me being here? What's the point of me waking up in the morning? Why? Now, if you answer this question honestly enough, it will tell you so much about yourself. When you wake up in the morning, where does my heart go? Do I first think about my job? Do I first think about my studies? Do I first think about, think about my family? Do I first think about, think about probably helping someone? All of these are not necessarily bad or good, but are they in the right place? Because you are meant to live this life to worship Allah alone. We all know this verse. We are created here to worship Allah. Why? That's the answer to this question about our lives is to worship Allah. So if we don't wake up in the morning passionate about this, fully engaged with it, there's a problem. When we go to bed, if that's not what we think about, if that's not what we're worried about, something there, something missing. Now a lot of people try to, they say we find it difficult, which is true, we find it difficult to develop the right intention. I find it difficult when I do something that I do it for the sake of Allah, especially with things that are done in public. This, the answer to this, if you develop the general frame, which is the goal for your life, the intention, general intention of your life, the why of your life, if you develop it strongly enough, you'll have no problem with the smaller deeds that you do in your, in your day. It will just fall in place. You, may, you might even sometimes not think so much about the intention that you need to do for the prayer because you, it's always on your mind. You're always connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you see we're getting close to the level of ihsan. Level of ihsan. Let's take it from a different perspective than the, the usual one. And ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah. That you worship Allah as if you see Him. What does that mean? Only when you pray, you are in that state. No, continuous. Throughout your life, you are aware of Allah. Everything. You know what happens? That's the beauty of creating that general frame, that dominant passion, which is Tawheed. Everything will be for you, not against you. Everything, no matter what. And that's the meaning of the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ reported by Imam Muslim. How amazing the state of a believer is. Everything, all his affairs are good for him. Everything. Calamity, he's patient, that's good for him. It's a blessing, so he's thankful and that's good for him. How can we reach that stage? When you reach the level of ihsan, which is through intention. That my life is for Allah, I live for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what I live for. So Allah is always on your mind. So whatever you see in this world tells you something about Allah. Everything you see, everything in this world you see, tells you something about Allah. And that's the meaning of some scholars of the past who said a statement that was later on distorted or misinterpreted by a lot of the deviant sects. They said, Inni ara Allah fi kulli shay. I see Allah in everything. 
a lot of people misinterpreted that uh, deviant sects and they took it to things that led them into kufr. But what the early scholars like Abu Ishaq al-Isfarayini, he had similar statements. What he meant, he meant that I, he has another statement, I see Allah in everything. That doesn't mean, okay, don't take the literal meaning here. He's a human being. What he means that everything tells me something about Allah. Everything is a lead to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When can you get to that state? When you develop that general intention for your life. My life is for Allah. And we all know the dua which we sometimes open our prayers with and it's there in the Quran قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say my prayers, my sacrifice, my life and my death, my living and my dying are all for Allah. That means, what does it mean? It means everything that has to do with me ultimately is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm always conscious about Allah, mindful about Allah. I'm always linked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why when even some hardship comes to you, you, f you see the blessings in it. You see the lessons you can learn from it. And that's how you grow. You see, Islam makes us stronger. Islam makes us stronger. It's not there just for you to practice Islam and become this kind of, some kind of a naive person or has nothing to do, some kind of hermit, has nothing to do with life. No. Allah sent down Islam for us to live this life in its full. To tap the, the highest level of life. Because we can't make it to Jannah without this life. The raw material for Jannah is this life. You have more money, you can do more righteous deeds. And that brings you higher in the sight of Allah. You have more physical power you can use it for Allah you gain more reward than others you have education you can use it for good for good ends and ultimately you get more reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you have better business you make more money as I said you can use it to strengthen the Muslims and that's it so your way to Allah did not create this ummah to this oh, sorry Allah did not create this world to distract us from the Akhirah. A lot of people deal with this dunya as if it's cursed. Yes, it's cursed, but don't take only this, this part of the statement. Carry on. The Prophet ﷺ said, this dunya is cursed, everything in it is cursed, except the remembrance of Allah and whatever is about this. What does it mean? That means this dunya is cursed if you follow it as an end. But if you use it as a means to establish the remembrance of Allah, to get closer to Allah for good ends, then it becomes blessed. So that's why the Prophet ﷺ was sent to us to help us understand what this life is all about and live this life. Now I'm about to recap, but I need to get from you some answers. What shape did you give intention? <coughs> you had something? A round shape, circle, why? Cycle. Okay, excellent. Someone else? Spiral. Spiral. Upward or downward? Yeah. Yeah, it could be upward, could be downward. Very good. Who, ha who had another shape? Which is a spiral? Could be and a cycle. They do feedback. Anyone came up with a funny shape? Excellent. Excellent. SubhanAllah, every time I ask this question, this answer comes about. Arrow. And to me, that's probably one of the best descriptions of, of intention. Because arrow shows intention. So it shows direction. And that's what intention is about. It gives you direction. And that has to do with choice. It has to do with choice. Okay, very good. Any other shapes? Funny ones? Orange? Ice cream? Okay, arrow is very interesting and the spiral and the cycle definitely explain one, uh, some aspects of the nature of intention. So that's what intention. Uh, I'll just close with one question, inshallah. Do you under, if you understand the hadith 
that we started with, the famous hadith, deeds are by their intention. If you think you've developed practical understanding now, in this session of this hadith, please put your hand up. If you feel you've developed practical, something that could really help you, put your hand up where I can see them. That's just for my personal feedback. Jazakumullah khair. Barakallah fikum. Okay, alhamdulillah. So that's inshallah, that was everything. And the issue of intention is so beautiful. And digging deep in the words of the early scholars, you will find treasures there, beautiful treasures, things that... And honestly, when we say that in Islam we have the best system of life, we shouldn't just say that without realizing what it is. There are so many treasures in the legacy of our scholars that we should dig deep, uh, bring out and develop. Develop it so it suits our present reality. We adapt it to our present reality. And this will strengthen you as a Muslim and help strengthen the Ummah as a whole. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair. If anybody has any questions, then we'll take a couple of questions now, inshallah. To reach the Ihsan level while for sins. Okay, I'll ask you one question. Do you think if, let's say you're standing in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are aware of his greatness, would you sin at that time? No. Then that's the answer to your question. Because that's what Ihsan is. You feel and you feel it truly that you are in the presence of Allah. No, that's not the case. When they sin, they fall off the level of Ihsan and they go back again. That's why Iman goes up and down. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, in some instances, for the major sins, for someone to fall in them, they can't be in a state of right Iman. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يزني الزاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن. A person does not commit zina while he's in a state of Iman. Another hadith reported by Ibn Umar, عنه, the Prophet ﷺ says, his Iman will be taken away from him, just put above him as a cloud. Then once he's done and he's back to his wits, it goes back down, back again to its place. So we're not always at the same level, we keep fluctuating and that's why people fall in sin. <laughs> Ask questions with the right intentions. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm just joking. Now, because there's uh, uh, one, one of the great scholars of Islam said, "Man istafham wa huwa yafham, fa huwa tarafun min al Whoever asks a question about something he already knows, then there's a hint of showing off there. I'm not talking about you, by the way. I'm just talking generally. Just went through my mind. Because sometimes people come to the sheikh or the teacher and they ask him something just to give him the impression that I've researched this matter and I, I know something about it. So he said that's a hint of riya. Be careful. So when you ask the question, ask it for the, for, for the right reason. Yeah, you had a question. In a sense, yes. Yeah. Okay. Generally, to answer, the brother is asking about uh, the angels don't, not having an intention. Is that right? Don't they have any hint of intention? They're not exactly like the sun and the moon, but in a general sense, yes. In, in terms, they have no choice. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them in the Quran uh, They don't disobey Allah no matter what He commands them to do, and they only do what they are commanded. They only do what they are commanded. Now, the issue that you brought about Jibreel alayhi salam, when, uh, which is an authentic narration, that when Fir'aun was drowning, he was saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illa alladhi amanat bihi banu Israel. I bear witness that there is no one who has the right to be worshipped except the one worshipped by Banu Israel. He, he still has the pride, he doesn't want to say Allah. 
He wants to say, I, I believe in the one whom the children of Israel have believed in. But he doesn't want to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Jibreel, knowing about Allah's mercy, he feared that Allah's mercy might fall on him. So he was putting mud in his mouth so he doesn't say it and save himself. Now, there could be a few answers to this. One of the answers possible is that it's, I, it could be that Allah, it, that was by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, that's number one. Another ex uh, answer could be, maybe Allah gave him choice, only temp temporary choice about this very incident. That's possible, okay? Uh, but generally speaking, the angel, angels do only what Allah commands them. Only what Allah, they don't do things out of their own initiative. There might be some exceptions here and there, but that's the general rule. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم